now. Um, yeah, that's okay. My daughter is loved. I love that. Um, I've been I've been praying about tonight uh, since last week and about where we're going to go tonight uh, and what what to talk about. And God kept bringing me back to something that I, I talked to the students about for a good solid month. Uh, and it was about faith. It's, it's a very foundational thought. But I feel like once you dig into it, it's such an important, especially what's going on right now uh, in our world and with the COVID. And, and just it's craziness. Sometimes you just feel like you're in a, a surreal world. Like it's just, it's just so different. And you're like, is this the world that, that I'm living in right now? Or is this just... Uh, a magical movie I'm watching that's about craziness and the superhero is going to show up, uh, which I do believe will happen. I believe Jesus will show up in this. Uh, but faith is such a, a pastor talked about the church being essential. So I want to kind of break it down even more that faith is essential, uh, but the, uh, the right faith, and I'll, I'll explain that more and more, but just, if you, just pray with me real quick, if you don't mind. Father, I just pray uh, that you would speak through me tonight. That it wouldn't be about Joseph. It would be about your truth. About your word. I pray that uh, if there's voids in people's hearts tonight. I pray that you'd fill them. I pray if there's emptiness in people's hearts. That you would fill them. Uh, whatever your desire for tonight happen. We pray that your will will be complete. And I pray that you'd use me as an instrument father. If there's something that's in my way of of being that instrument, I pray that you'd release it right now. And I just thank you for your truth. I'm honored that we can just bow our heads and talk to you and talk about you publicly. And I, I do pray for our country and I pray for this world because we're seeing a lot of crazy things in this country right now, but I guarantee all these things have been happening all over the world uh, for, for a long time now, Lord. And I just pray for a, a revival of your spirit that would happen in a mighty way, not in just this country, but in this world, that people would turn to you, Lord. And we just thank you for this moment right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I mentioned uh, we'll be in 1 Kings 19 if you want to go ahead and turn there if you have your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to get one. It's a pretty good book. Uh, I have a few of them. Uh, it's a great resource. If you truly believe it's a life source, and you should have it with you, uh, or you should have it, period. Uh, it's, it just brings so much for us. But we'll be in 1 Kings 19. So as, as I said before, Pastor has, has talked about the church being essential, and I want to kind of break it down about how faith is essential and how, um, how so much that we allow things to destroy our faith, uh, circumstances, situations in our life. But to get to that point, I want to talk about Elijah for a second. Elijah is known for prophesying drought and sub subsequently uh, being fed by ravens before his epic challenge to the prophet of Baal. Uh, his faith moved God to answer by fire, and Elijah killed all the false prophets and then prophesied rain. But when the king's wife, old Jezebel, came into place, I heard about all this, and she threatened his life. Elijah's uh, humanity kicked in as he ran for his life, and this is where he find, we find ourselves in 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 3. So then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba uh, that belonged to Judah, he left his servants there, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under the broom, of, broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough. Don't you feel like sometimes, like, you just, things going on right now, you're like, oh, Lord, I just, I've had enough after this last flood. I was kind of right there. It's like, oh, Lord, I've had enough of this. Uh, and that's where he found it. He said, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him, and the angel told him, get up and eat. Then he looked and there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him. And he said, get up and eat or the, uh, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up, ate, drank. Then on the, 
on the strength from the food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountains of God. Amen. Those ministries of exercise might help if this comes upon us. You never know. Verse 9, he entered a cave there and spent the night. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? This is what God's response here. What are you doing here? Elijah's faith is on the verge of being shattered at this point. But when I, when I took a look at the scripture about faith and look at the life of Elijah, I started wondering, why, how did you get to this point? Even though we could probably all relate where he's at right now. But you, you, you look at the word of God and you, you see different uh, scriptures that he breathed out in different people. Like Matthew 21, 22 where he says, And whatever you, you ask in prayer you will receive if you have faith. Hebrews 11, 6, And without faith it, is, is faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Matthew 17, 20, Truly I tell you, Jesus said, if you have faith as small of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountains, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing is impossible for you. And I started thinking about this faith and, and I think about all these, uh, Jesus is constantly talking to us about faith and we should have this, this idea that faith can move mountains, faith can do these things. But then we come to these places in our life that has a tendency of shattering them shattering our faith for instance poor choices has a tendency of shattering our faith we we at some point obviously I, i'm not just saying you i'm saying we all make bad decisions and poor choices in our lives at one point or another and we look back at it but why does it lead to abandoned faith because conviction leads to guilt and sometimes we don't know how to deal with that I mean, we either handle it by asking for forgiveness and getting right with God, or we change our whole belief system. If we can convince ourselves that there is nothing wrong with what we are doing, then our guilt will just go away. Or changing how we believe is always easier than changing how we behave. And this is what has a tendency of wrecking our faith at times. Or unexplainable tra tragedy. We talked about our widows and widowers Man, just an em emptiness in those moments. How can God let something happen like that? How can, le how can God let, you know, babies or, or teenage or young people pass away before their parents? Or uh, how can God strip somebody of my life when I've known them my whole life for 50 years or 60 years? And th these have uh, sometimes a tendency of wrecking our faith. Faith, again, is rooted in what is happening at the moment. Or our own lack of understanding often leads to shattered faith. We feel like we have to have all the answers, and we tend to doubt when we can't explain things. It has a tendency of wrecking our faith. Why did Elijah come to this place in life? Because along the way, his relationship with Jesus transformed from essential faith to what I call circumstantial faith. So let's talk about that for a second. Circumstantial faith. This is something we hit on a lot in the student ministry because it's something that is so prevalent and then we, we don't realize we're there. But circumstantial faith is faith defined, is where faith is defined by our own ability to interpret events in our life. That's circumstantial faith. For instance, maybe you, what's up, buddy? You good? Fantastic. All right. For instance, uh, we have some hunters in the house. Uh, you're on the last day of hunting season. You took down maybe a couple of does, but you've been holding off for that buck. So you're the last day, and, you, and you're in your seat, and you begin to pray, Lord, if you could just, you know, a 12-point come out right now, the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life, that would be a great thing, you know. One of my most favorite moments uh, in the last 10 years, I was uh, in the deer stand with my dad. It's like the, I just got back into hunting um, and never killed anything. Just got back in it from high school just so I could hang out with my dad. And we happened to be in the same deer stand. Uh, and it was at the end of the, the, the hunt. We were about to leave. And I, I said, I just, Lord, if you could just let one come out, that would be a very cool moment right now. And I swear, the heavens opened up. There was a light that came from heaven that shined right over here. Angels were like, oh, 
but not too loud because it scares deer. And the biggest, like, tent, where it was an eight point, big eight point the size of an elk. Well, it might not have been that big, but it looked that big <laughs> from a distance, came out, and I pulled that gun up. And, you know, you get in those moments, you're like, oh, okay, okay, I can do this. And then shot it, and it, you know, just went and got my first deer. It was a cool moment because I was with my dad, and, and he was more excited than I was. He about peed on himself in that moment. But, uh, but it was truly an exciting moment uh, because I was with him. But listen, it doesn't always happen like that. Doesn't, most of the time, it never happens like that, right? We're in a stand. It's like, all right, God, let me, let me have that deer, and it doesn't come. And this is what I call, call circumstantial faith. It's that moment where you, you pray and pray and pray and pray, and, and, and it doesn't get answered, and we're like, oh, well, God must not love us. God, God, God must not be on our side. And I know that sounds silly, but how many times have we done that with somebody's life? That we say, all right, God, could you just heal this person? I really love them. I want them to stick around. I want them to be here. And then God doesn't answer that in the way we want, and we're like, God, why? Why is this happening? Like, and, and you start kind of fading away because why would God let that happen if he loved me? And this is, this is a circumstantial faith I'm talking about. Elijah began to let his circumstances dictate his faith. There's so many examples in the Bible of the opposite side of this. Joseph spends 15 years in prison after his brothers sold him into slavery. He didn't see what God was doing, but he had faith that God was going to deliver him. And you know that story. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, facing a fiery furnace. The list goes on. Yet, if God doesn't answer our prayers by the next week, we wonder if he really exists. If we don't see God at work in our immediate circumstances, we lose our confidence in him. All of this is caused by our faulty view of faith. And we can get wrapped up in our circumstances, and our circumstances is the depend on uh, what our faith is going to look at. We have to, listen, our church has been through the ringer this last year. I mean, not this last year. I mean, I've been here in five years and personally been through four floods. I mean, I mean, come on. It, and the pastor says it all started when I got here, so I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, is, it is true. Uh, on that note, I'll be resigning tonight. Uh, no. This is a true story. After Harvey, somebody came up to me, and somebody from our church says, do you ever think that maybe God's trying to tell you something? That's a true story. Somebody had told me that. I'm like, uh, yeah, he told me to tell you to shut up and get out of here. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say it. I might have thought that. I'm like, I should have. But the foundation of our faith should not be determined by recent events or circumstances. Faith should not be based on what? Essential faith is based on who? The foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. There was this older lady in Houston, and um, she, was, she was one of those that just go on a porch every morning, and she just gives praise to God. She's like, God, just thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this cup of coffee. Just thank you so much, God. And right next to her and her neighbor was an atheist, and he couldn't stand her because she went on her porch every morning and praised God. And then the corona kicked up, and uh, she couldn't go out and get groceries. So she went on her porch, and she's like, God, could you just deliver me some groceries, some toilet paper? I need some help here, Lord. Can you just help me out? The next morning, she walked up, and on her porch was all these groceries and toilet paper. And she went, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for providing for me. Thank you for, for delivering. And the atheist jumped out of the bush. He said, ha, ha, I got you. I bought these groceries. And she's all, thank you, Lord, for providing and making the devil pay for it. <laughs> Faith wasn't determined Faith wasn't determined by her circumstances. Her circumstances were determined by her faith. In the book of Hebrews, if you want to turn to the first chapter here, I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time just reading this. But in the book of Hebrews, the author writes to the Christians who are being pressured by the Jewish community. They're asking them pretty much to abandon their faith, uh, to make to make it worse, they were told that Jesus was coming back soon, and he hadn't yet, so they were beginning to doubt this whole Christian thing. Their faith was being wavered by the circumstances. But he writes here, and I just I love this set of scriptures because 
you know, it doesn't sit there and say you need to have faith, you need to have faith, you need to have faith. It all focuses on the supremacy of Jesus and who he is. So in verse 1, it says, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets of di at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has pointed him heir of all things and made the universe, made the universe through him. Verse 3. The Son is the radiance. I love this verse. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than, their, than theirs. Verse 5, For to which the angels did ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father, or again uh, I will be his father and he will be my son again when he brings his firstborn to the world he says and let God's angels worship him and then the writer keeps going on and on and on about the supremacy of Jesus and then if you skip and you just write this down 4 14 he concludes here therefore since he we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast to our confession Faith isn't on what. Faith should be determined by who? By Jesus Christ. We can't let our circumstances around us dictate our faith. And we have done it over and over and over. And you can see it just in the past few months how uh, our world has been shattered because we let the circumstances around us get to us rather than say, you know what, this is just another day. He's in charge, He is King. If Christ is who he says he is, then we don't have to worry about bad things happening. If Christ really died for the sins of the world, then we, don't, we have no reason to doubt his love. If Christ is coming back for us, then we have to know that he has our best interests in mind. And our faith and hope rest on anything other than the person of Christ, then we are building our life upon fragile foundation. The foundation of our faith cannot rest on our ability to figure out the mysteries of life or our ability to figure out how everything fits together, how consistently things go our way, how closely God follows our plan for our life. Whether or not God answers our prayers, he is not our personal genie. Our faith should not be determined by these things, but we let it too much. Essential faith is faith that is rooted in the person of Christ. Circumstances should not determine our faith. Our faith should determine our circumstances. It's all about him. After Elijah lost out due to circumstantial faith, God kept asking him, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Then if you go back to his response in verse 10, he begins to label all these things that are happening around him. He wasn't talking about the things that happened before, how God delivered him in so many ways. He's talking about all the things that were going wrong right there. And then God kept saying, what are you doing here? You've lost it. You've lost the sight. You've lost the vision and the focus. You're, you're so focused on what's wrong happening or the, the things happening, the circumstances around you, that you've lost sight. In Revelations, you've lost sight of your first love. What are you doing here? Our country is turning itself uh, into a, a, a mess right now. Turning against one another, riots are happening. The fear of the virus has taken over so many people. Uh, not even just adults, but students or teenagers and children. We're passing that down. Uh, pastors are being arrested for having church. That's our country. That's what's happening. It's crazy. God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, church? What are you waiting for you? I told you that you could move mountains with your faith. Why are you waiting for the mountains to move to have faith? You can move the mountains. You can have the faith. You can know that I got your back. Where are you? Circumstances should not determine your faith. Your faith should determine your circumstances. Just the last thought. This is, this is super quick, I know. But if your faith is determined by the who, 
by Jesus Christ, but you don't know Jesus Christ, then you don't know faith. I mean, your circumstances, you can say, yeah, I know God, I, know, I love him, and he's great, and all this stuff, but if it's not in who, if you don't know who he is, if you're not in the word, understanding more and more about him, and you're not talking to him, you're not welcoming him into your home, you're not having a relation, one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, then you will never understand what essential faith is all about. You'll keep letting the waves crash against you, and you're going to keep moving around, and you're going to keep, well, God, why is this happening? And you're going to be confused, and, and you're going to be wavering in the waves. But the, the, the faith is in who? is in Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus Christ? And that's, that's something that you have to determine as you read this thing. Just a few thoughts. I mean, he's a pretty amazing guy. I mean, he's a pretty amazing God. In the, in the Word of God, it says Jesus is an advocate, almighty, alpha, Authority, author, beloved, bread of life, bridegroom, cornerstone, counsel, deliverer, Emmanuel, everlasting God, faithful, freedom, good shepherd, great high priest, head of the church, hope, holy, I am, incre indescribable, judge, king of kings, lamb, light, lion, lord, love, mediator, messiah, mighty one, omega, peace, perfecter, prophet, prince, redeemer, risen lord, rock, sacrifice, savior, son of God, son of man, supreme creator, the door, the way, the truth, the life, the word, the true vine, victorious one, wonderful. And that's just a few. That's just a few. He is these things. He is God. And he's got your back. Where are you, Elijah? Where are you, church? Where is your focus? Where is your individual focus? Is it, is it being tossed in the, the wind with your circumstances around you? Listen, circumstances will always be crazy around you. As long as sin exists in this world, the circumstances are going to get cray-cray up here, right? Yeah, sorry, I went. Student pastor, sorry. Yeah. It will always be crazy. As long as sin is around and exists, it's going to be crazy. But Jesus will always have the throne. Jesus will always be God. He is worthy of our sight and our focus. And so if we keep our eyes on him and stop worrying about all these things around us, then we're going to keep going that direction and the path that he wants us to go. And he loves us. He does want the best for us. He wants us to go down this, the right path, uh, a path that will lead us to so many blessings in our lives. But if we keep looking around, we're going to sink in the water like Peter did. We're going to keep our eyes on him. Father, I pray that our circumstances do not uh, depend on, or our circumstances do not affect our faith. I pray that our faith will determine our circumstances. I pray as we keep our clear eyes and clear sight on you, Father, that the world around us will, will change itself and work itself out because you'll work through us in mighty ways. You'll begin not only to change our lives, but change the lives around the people around us. And then our circumstances will begin to honor you because our eyes are on you. Father, help us get to that point. Father, help us, not only your church, but the, the, your church across this whole world would start changing things. Father, let us move some mountains in your name. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.